So welcome to another uh, oral history uh, interview in an ongoing project of the Ozark Studies Institute of the Missouri State University Libraries. Uh, my name is Tom Peters. I'm the Dean of Libraries. Today's date is Thursday, April 13th, 2023. And our special guest today is Glenn Stockton. Glenn, thank you very much for joining us. And thank you for inviting me, sir. My pleasure. And I should have mentioned this uh, interview is happening on the campus, the main Springfield campus of Missouri State University, in the Ozarks room at the top floor of Dwayne G. Meyer Library. Um, so, Glenn, uh, you've had a wonderful life, but we kind of want to focus today on what happened to you in when your family moved to Springfield and... Um, uh, you got caught up in what's now known as the Great Cobra Scare of 1953. Before we get there, though, I want to say, uh, or you tell us, where and when were you born? Born in Minneapolis, Minnesota, August 23rd, 1946. Okay. At the time we moved here, I was five years old until August, so I started in Springfield at age five. And we lived out in what is now the, well, later became the clubhouse for the Hickory Hills Country Club. And, uh, really? Mm -hmm. And I had wonderful memories of living out in the country. There was a little woods next to us with the creek going through it that had turtles, and I'd go out and play. And I had a, had a new puppy which roamed everywhere I went, and it was a, it was a paradise life. And then it came up pretty close to the time we'd be going to school, but my puppy was killed in the road. Mm -hmm. And my mother was fearful that my brother and I would be standing out on that same road waiting for a, a school bus, and that we could also be struck. And so she pressed my father to move us into the city. Mm -hmm. He loved living out there. It was a wonderful place, and yet, she insisted. So she and I came in and went around the city and looking for available rentals and we came across one where we moved to. However, before then I had been to Mr. Moyer's shop and my father took, took us there after we went out for dinner that night. And he had uh, quite a few creatures in his shop that were a fright. He had water moccasins, he had spinning cobra, he had all sorts of things which didn't really look like cats. And a cobra spits venom. Yes. They, if you see a picture of one, and I think I brought one with me, they have a little opening in the back of their throat, and when they take down a victim, they spray uh, a venom into their eyes. Oh, yeah. And my mother said to my father, that snake could kill people without even biting them. Well, as she was discussing that with him, my brother and I were lingering outside. There were some crates there stacked up in the yard, and they were about five or six inches high, and they had round holes in the sides. <laughs> and I went, oh, chicky, chicky, chicky. And I was putting my fingers in it, hoping they'd peck on my fingers, you know. And my brother headed into the store, and he turned around and came running back, and he shoved me to the ground. He says, those are dangerous snakes. I said, how do you know? He said, there's a sign on the other side. Well, there was no warning when I came up. And it was dusk as well, wasn't it? Or? It was dark. Yeah. His porch light was on, and we yeah. couldn't really see the sign, but he hadn't seen the shop earlier and decided he'd go back to us. He was open in the evening. And so we uh, went in and the folks were looking at puppies and I chose one and I was so happy and then I told Mr. Moyer, uh, Mr. Moyer, there's snakes in your front yard. He said, yes, those are mine. And I said, but I didn't know there were snakes and I was poking my fingers in the holes thinking they were little chickens. And the sign that warned us was on the other side, facing the uh, porch light. I said, I could have been bitten by a poisonous snake, my brother told me. 
And my mother said, we leave right now. And she stormed out the door. She wasn't going to be in there one minute longer. Mm -hmm. Too dangerous. And as we left, she looked across the street and there was a sign there on the house for rent. And she said to my father, that is the last place in Springfield I would ever want to live. Now, about two months later, that's where we were living. And when my brother and I discovered where we were, it was absolutely delightful. We could go over and see the animals every day. But my mother wasn't delighted. <coughs> so at, uh, at supper time, she says to my father, do you realize we just moved into the one house in the city I would never live? And he said, and whose decision was that? You didn't like living in the country? You were fearful of it? You pressed me to move here? And so here we are, across the street from Mr. Moyer. Your decision, so just live with it. <laughs> and this was East St. Louis Street. 1420 East St. Louis Street. Yeah. Mr. Moyer was at 1421. 21. East St. Louis Street. Uh, I think the the pet shop building is no longer standing. No. It was yeah. it was torn down. I came back to Springfield in 1958 in the summer. Four years after we had left. And it was no longer up even then. And our house had been taken down just after we moved out. Mm. When the snake was discovered in our my, my garden, my mother saw it. And she ran out to bring up in her children who were on the front lawn. She babbled and she was panicking. We thought something was wrong with her, so we ran for it. My brother took one sister down the sidewalk pushing her stroller, I took my other sister, who was two, and we went into the backyard. I was going to get away from her by going through the backyard into the alley. We were actually afraid of her. Mm -hmm. And as we came up towards the garden, something was coming through the grass, which was about six inches high, and I, it was coming right for us. So I put my sister behind me and said, don't move and don't say anything, you're real quiet. Then suddenly a snake reared up right in front of me, about four feet away, and its hood spread, and it started weaving back and forth, black meaty eyes looking at me, mm -hmm. tongue flicking in her mouth. And I went, oh, it's a cobra. And I closed my eyes so he wouldn't spit into him if he was a spitting cobra, and I remained perfectly still. I didn't want to start it. Well, I heard a noise, and I looked over. My father was coming out the back door. He had a hammer, and he threw it at the snake's head. He might have hit it. It looked like it was going to be a contact, but the snake saw it, and just at half of an eye blink, it struck that, that hammer. It was so quick, you couldn't even see the strike hardly. Oh, it struck at it. Oh. Struck, struck it as it was coming to it. To really? It. And that flattened the snake. It didn't kill him, but it knocked him out, or knocked him down. And my father grabbed my sister and said, get over to sister at the house next door. And I said, Dwayne went down the sidewalk with Margaret and with, uh, with Glenda. He's pushing her stroll and he said, I'll take care of it. Just get over there. So I went over and he collected my mother from the front yard, took her over, and he retrieved my sister and brother. Hmm. And we were in sister's house. Well, when we told him what was going on, he closed the windows. And it didn't take long, and it got hot and stuffy in there. I said, do you have a fan? He said, it wouldn't do any good. No, he didn't have a fan. It was just hot and muggy, and it was getting unbearable. Mm -hmm. My father called up Officer Frank Pike, the chief of police, and he told him that there was a king cobra in our backyard, and it had crawled into a hole in our foundation. I've never figured out to this day why they didn't patch that hole. Mm. There it was. And so Officer Frank came out and he said, where's this hole? And my father showed him and he gets down and he reaches into the hole. And went, we were watching from next door. Uh-oh. He pulled out a long snake skin that had been shed. 
Mm. Very colorful, had nice markings and everything. He and my father stood there for a minute looking at it. And he said, I'm taking this downtown, having it checked out, verified, I'll be back. Well, when he came back, he had several officers with him. They had guns, shotgun was one. And they had flashlights, they had uh, poles, I think they had a couple of hoes. They had trampled my garden down looking for that snake. <laughs> so curiosity was setting in. The, the neighbors all came over and the media came out and they put big bright lights up. There was a van in the alley running. They rolled out a, a, a TV camera or two had big cables running to the van, so apparently they were doing a, a live uh, broadcast on 1953. 53. If that was KY3, that must yeah. have been like one of their first remotes. Had, well, I don't know how it was TV. There might have been a, a, a if it was TV, they were using film stock. It would there be was no film video, still? There was no video cameras. Well, something was hooking to the van. Maybe it was audio. Very possible it was a radio station. But I was inside looking out. Yeah, there. yeah, it, had, it could have been a radio station. But see, Channel 3, Channel 3 didn't go on the air until that month, until yeah, October. And they didn't have remotes. No, was, and Channel 10 didn't. Okay, so I'm yeah. Sam corrected yeah. on that. The, yeah. But so, but the media found out that night. Yes, and they were down there with lights. So oh. it was well lighted. And there was quite a crowd in our backyard. So the media frenzy, frenzy became, started almost immediately. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, as soon as it hit the wire service, yeah, then it was, yeah. Or was it like a national deal, too? Well, or yeah, Life like Magazine sent a reporter. Really? And and <laughs> Betty Love, they she, they got Betty Love at Betty Love. Hank Billings. And they, uh, she did the photography for the Life Magazine article. Yeah. Uh, this is John Sellers, uh, uh, I don't know, Director Emeritus? Is Director that Emeritus, yeah. Of the History Museum on the Square. Yeah. He's also here at this interview, so... Uh, that other voice is from John Sellers. So, so j just to make sure that I understand. So, as far as we know, your mother was the first one to encounter a cobra. As she part didn't actually get close to it, but she saw it. She, she saw it enough that she wigged out, as yeah. we would have said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we had plenty. She of probably was the first one. We had plenty of experiences. With hindsight, she, she might have been the first yeah. one to... Well, the, the first one that they, they captured, or had a dead one, was the one that got run over in the middle of the street. Was that Nash before this? Nashville or? and St. Louis. Well, oh, they already knew there were snakes. They knew there was some kind of weird snake there. <laughs> okay. But Maurer had told them that that snake, they took it down to Maurer to be identified, <laughs> and Maurer told them it was a puff adder and it wasn't harmful. Oh. He was quite a strange fellow. Mm -hmm. I, I liked Mr. Moyer. He was kind to me. He was generous. He let me be there as much as I want. He gave me uh, a couple of fish for taking home. I bought a finch for my mother there. Yeah. I threw in another finch in the cage and some speed. Um, he was, it was a very educational experience. I'll say that for you. <laughs> but Equally so, it was also a very dangerous experience. And I witnessed a six foot uh, lizard, I believe it now was it uh, iguana, is it? Yeah. the one that gets so large, and they go right up a tree like a squirrel. I was walking along the sidewalk, and there was a little trench there, and I was putting my foot into it, one on the sidewalk and one in the trench, and I wasn't watching where I was going, and I stepped on something and it wriggled out from under my shoe, and I looked up as a huge lizard went up in the tree. And it was above me, and it was perched on this limb, looking at me, and it was doing like push-ups. And its beady eyes were on me, and its tongue was flicking in and out, and I thought, that's as big as an alligator, and alligators eat people. So I started backing off, and I got maybe 20, 30 feet away, and I just turned and ran. And you're Mr. six years old. Six years old. And I went to Mr. Moyer's shop, and I beat on the door. He lived there. It was a Sunday. He wasn't, he wasn't open. And he opened the door, and he was with a, uh, another man, and they were talking. And I think it was this um, 
Arthur Jones, the one that tied in with him in 52 and supplied him all of these animals and they were coming in. Mm. And the two of them ran with me and I showed them where the lizard were and they put a pole up the tree that had a rope on it and they put it over the lizard's neck and they pulled him out of the tree and that thing fought ferociously and they managed to get him in a big bag and pull it shut and haul him back and put him back in his cage. Well, the next day I came in, asked Mr. Moyer, um, where, do you, where do you keep that big lizard? He said, I'll show you. So we walked around to his garage, walked right in the side door, and you could open the door with just a push of your fingers. It only had a weak little spring and it pushed out. It wasn't locked. Just turned the lights on and there was there were multiple cages there with animals in them. And here was this gigantic lizard in, in a cage. And next to the lizard was an orangutan. Well, I'd already seen the lizard but the orangutan got my attention. So I said, uh, what kind of monkey is this? He had all red hair and real long arms and about my size. <clears throat> he said it's uh, a wild orangutan. I said, oh, can I pet him? He says, no, don't get anywhere near him. He's, he's a wild animal. He's very dangerous. Said, he doesn't look dangerous to me. He says, well, look at this. He took a large nut out of a bag on the table, put it on a wooden spoon, and he held it out. And the orangutan reached out, and he got it, and he crushed it in his hand just like it was an egg. Mm -hmm. And he started picking out the pieces to eat them. Mm -hmm. And I went, wow, Mr. Moyer, if my father had done that, he would have <coughs> used his bench vice or a big pliers or something. I said, he's real strong. And Mr. Moyer said, he's several times stronger than any man. Mm. And he could easily break your arm if you held it out there. Mm. Went, oh. He said, these are wild animals. You keep your distance from them. So he did warn me. And then I noticed, I said, Mr. Moyer, watch this. And I took a banana out of the bag <coughs> and held it out. And the orangutan was reaching for it. And I got closer and finally he got the banana. And I said, you see? If he stretches, he can reach the latch on the lizard's cage, and he can slide it open. It was a dead bolt. Mm. And I said, Mr. Moyer, is that how this big lizard got loose? And he thought for a moment, and he said, maybe. And that was it. Mm. I could tell then it was carelessness. Yeah. And then I saw, he, he, I said, if you make it safer, he said, I'll move the cage as far as the part. So he moved the lizard cage over and I was looking at the orangutan and I said, he isn't secured either. He's got hands pretty much like mine. All he has to do is reach up out of the bar <coughs> and pull this little bolt latch, they called it. Mm -hmm. It's like you put a leash on a dog. He could have done it easy as I could. And he's out. And there's nothing keeping them in here. They can just leave. Mm -hmm. And I said, look at all these snakes in here, boxes of snakes, snakes in glass cages. I said, these are dangerous. I said, anybody can come in here, they could get hurt or let them loose. Mm -hmm. He said, oh, nobody would do that. No fear. Mm -hmm. In later years, I was reading Dr. Doolittle. Now I could talk with the animals and walk with the animals and all this sort of thing. I was thinking about stories I had heard recently, like the story of Johnny Appleseed, who disregarded danger and nature. Nothing ever harmed him. He never harmed them. It's a kind of a special breed, I think. Mm. They have to be gifted. The rest of us are fearful of snakes and orangutans and big lizards and, mm -hmm. and even this big African lion he had brought over in a cage. Mm -hmm. I noticed a month or so later the cage was in his backyard, but there was no lion in it. <laughs> I didn't want to know how they transferred that in, in a busy neighborhood. Mm. <sighs> the fears with that place ran my mother into migraines. And she pleaded and pleaded with my father to move us out. He didn't want to move. Mm -hmm. He had a successful business. He had a, 
uh, industrial electric and he did uh, commercial engine motor repair, uh -huh. like big electric motors, and he did also televisions repair. He was a technician. He didn't want to move. He wanted to stay put. Springfield was where his family lived. He was from Crane. Crane. He was born in Crane. Yeah. And uh, his mother was living there at the time. In Crane? In Crane. So you go down to visit Gram Grandma uh, on about Sundays? And two years ago. No, I never got to, uh -huh. to uh, see him. He died before I was born. Yeah. But she was still alive. She was my only grandmother. And we'd go to Crane. If you've been there, it's a charming little place. Mm -hmm. It's very quiet. It's, uh, it's where he grew up. And his family moved to Springfield, and he wanted to move to Springfield. And so we did when I was five. But in all of this, I felt a, a need to keep secretive about what I was seeing. In a way, it was privileged information. And in looking back, I wondered why I didn't contact Officer Frank Pike, who I knew, and have him come and look at the unsecured cages. Mm -hmm. Something could happen. And the poisonous snakes stacked up in the front yard and the backyard in crates. And Mr. Moyer would open up a crate of snakes. It didn't matter what it was. It could be cobras. It could be water moccasins. It could be anything. And he'd take them over to his bathtub that was out in the backyard for the water. And he'd wash off his snakes and he'd put them in fresh boxes. <laughs> now, he sold snakes that way by mail. He had advertisements in national magazines and so forth. You could order snakes from me by mail. Oh my gosh. So he, you get a box with holes in it, and here's your snake. So I asked him one day, are cobras pets? He said, no, you could hardly call it a pet. I said, why do you keep them? He said, well, there are people that like having a unique creature. They keep them in a glass cage in their, in their house. Mm -hmm. I thought that was so strange. I had fish I loved. My mother had fish that she loved. They had a puppy before he got killed. That was pets. But a man killing lizard, snake, orangutan, lion, he was very careless. So he was both a pet shop owner but also uh, uh, exotic animals. Yes. Yeah. For zoos. Now today, 2023, when we think of a zoo, we think of a you know, uh, zoos have their own system now. They share animals back and right. forth. You know, they're not out capturing wild animals anymore. Uh, but back then, I, I'm guessing the traffic in zoo animals was much looser than it is today. And there were different types of zoos. So there were like roadside zoos, you know, uh, kind of small scale operations. Well, Pat, who bought these animals that weren't pets, and he said uh, large zoos, which you find in cities, and also little roadside zoos. And I said, I've never been to one of those. I wanted to go, but my father said, they're just tourist traps that take all your money. <laughs> and he said, Glenn, you love seeing the animals. And I said, yes, I, I love it. I come over every day, you know, yes. <laughs> and he said, are you with your family driving along and the kids are bored and they say, look, there's a free zoo. Families pull in. Mm -hmm. And they do this to attract more people in their store so they could you know, increase their business. Mm -hmm. I said, would they be interested in buying a giant snake or a orangutan or a big lizard? And he said, probably not. Those would go to St. Louis and other places. But he said, there's no danger in it. It's entertainment. And it's free. You don't have to spend money when you go, but they hope you will. <coughs> I'm like, oh. Well, I found out in doing research on this the last few months that the people he was supplying those animals to had a backroom racket 
they would entice the father to come back and see something that was spectacular. And while he's there, there are men playing cards, playing poker. And he'd say, would you like to join in a friendly game? Well, friendly game involved money. And many times they would take people for quite a bit of money in those games. So the family looking at the animals and the gifts. Father's back there gathering with the boys. <laughs> So he got tied in with some very um, low-key characters. Yeah. Smuggler. And this um, Arthur Jones was among them. There were others. It was a... Uh, it was a constant conflict with me that I was enjoying it. I was watching other people enjoy his business. And yet I knew any time something could happen that would be disastrous. Yeah, so you were both drawn to the store, but also it causes some deep anxiety for you. Well, it caused years of trauma with me. Yeah. And eventually, when we had the discovery of the rattle of the of the cobra, I was just thinking rattlesnakes. That's one. That's one uh, thing I didn't see in there. But I grew up with rattlesnakes in Arizona in later years. I, uh, I realized something could happen because he had no security whatsoever. And he was like, a, he did, did he have any employees? Or just, no. uh, just supply, it was just, just him. him. Just, just him. him. Yeah. He, ran, he lived in the house, upstairs. And downstairs was his operation. Yeah. And I never saw him out mowing a lawn or doing anything outside. He was always in the store. Hmm. Uh, after the great Cobra, Cobra scare, did he ever fess up? No. Um, I didn't see him for about two weeks before this Cobra was discovered in our house. I had gone over to see him on, on one occasion and I had to ask if I could use his restroom. He said, sure, go ahead. It was right there where customers could use it. So I opened, started to open the door and a big mouth opened right in front of me with big fangs. <laughs> Bam! The door was closed in a blink. And I yelled, Mr. Moyer, there's a dinosaur in your bathroom. <laughs> he chuckled. He said, that's just my new snake, that's all. I said, that's a snake? How could it be so big? He said, well, it's probably the biggest snake ever captured. And I said, how big? I don't know. I said, but it's a monster. He said, no, it is. Where did it come from? He said, it came in last night from Brazil. They brought it in at night, I assume, so nobody would see him transport it. The poor lady that lived to his left, she had quite a few incidents, more than I did. Mm. I'm trying to remember her name, and I can't. She even had one of these big iguanas on her screen door one morning. And she opened her door, and here's this huge thing, and she called him up and said, come get your monster lizard. She was so mad at him. Because it all, things always got loose. Now, if that 33 foot anaconda had gotten loose, it was 33 feet long because he sold it that day. And there were 14 muscle men came out. They were there for the lar world's largest snake. And it was um, a kind of a circus or a road show or something that was coming through. And they were working. It's going to be at the Shrine Mosque. That's yes, like where a, he was. Yeah. Uh, the, this manager. And when Mr. Moyer, I showed him an article in the paper that they had the biggest snake in the world. Is it bigger than yours? He said, Well, mine could eat a 21 foot snake. He said, Mine could have that for breakfast. So he calls the man up and tells him, I've got the biggest snake. It's at my place. The man says, Is this some sort of a prank? He said, I'm Leo Moyer. I have the animal import business about a mile east on St. Louis, 1421. 
come out and see it for yourself and bring lots of muscle. You're going to need it to get this big fella stretched out for measuring. <laughs> and I thought, I could badly better go home. And this is too much. Yeah. I said, I couldn't. There was both the fear, the impulse to run for my life, and yet there was the intense curiosity just how big that snake was that I hadn't seen the whole thing. Yeah. So I stayed. Well, about 40 minutes after the call, a, a van pulled, a large van pulled into his driveway and behind it were three cars. And four men out of each car got out, plus there was a couple in the uh, truck. The manager came in and he said, show me your great snake. I stood way back out on the porch with the screen door open. I was watching from distance. Ready to run. <laughs> I had a short sprint getting home, and we didn't lock our front door during the day. So I watched, and Mr. Moyer said, sure. He just nonchalantly opens the door about six inches, and the man saw the same thing I did. He goes, oh, my God. He said, that, that thing is straight from hell. I had to take it out of my book because I know kids are reading it. <laughs> and we didn't swear in those days, at least the kids didn't. Mm. My father did, he made a, a, a career out of it. He had quite a few colorful words. <laughs> so, Mr. Mr. Moyer says, have you ready to take a measurement yet? He says, yes. So he calls his man in. These guys all look like, uh, what do you say? Professional the, wrestlers. The Rock. Yeah. Big, big muscle man. I thought, <laughs> whoa, I've never seen guys that big. Well, they came in and they had straps with a handle on each end and they needed them to get around that snake. It was too big to put their arms around it. Mm. They had to have the extension. And they had a black bag. So Mr. Boyce says, you're ready? And they're on each side of the door. We're ready. And he opened the door and this guy threw a black bag over its head. He pulled the straight and the muscle men started grabbing this thing. And about every two feet or so, another guy had put it around from the other side. Mm -hmm. Finally, he looked like a 28-foot centipede, <clears throat> and they walked it out the front door. Oh, boy. My heart was just, <sighs> go home, go home. But I had to hear how long it was. Well, it was 33 feet. Mr. Moyer said... 33-foot snake. Yes. In the front yard. Stretched out across the whole front yard to the drive. And this is along Route 66. Uh-huh. And cars were coming by both directions, and they'd break to a stop. Screech! <laughs> and I knew my mother would hear that and look out, and she would see the snake. She would have died. <laughs> and I'm guessing the front yard, I, I know there still are some homes along that stretch of old Route 66. Those front yards were not that big. Well, it, they were, oh boy, they have 50-foot lot. It took up, you know, 33 feet of the 50-foot line. The 50-foot line took up everything but his driveway. Yeah. So they pulled that thing out and ran a tape measure from nose to tail. And he said, we're getting just about 33 feet here. And Mr. Moyer says, are you ready to deal then? The fellow said, yeah. So he said to the man, throw him in the cage in the, in the van and uh, stand by. So he and Mr. Moyer went in. They did about five minutes worth of business, and they came out. He says, okay, man, we're taking our old snake out. He's staying. So they hauled this 21-foot snake out. They couldn't get their arms around him. <sighs> By then, I think I was about ready to have my first heart attack. <laughs> Too many big snakes. So they put him in Mr. Moyer's bathroom with an unlocked door. Okay, I decided after that I wouldn't go back. That was it. I, it, was, it was too frightening. Mm -hmm. And I was so messed up and I was having nightmares. My mother was having them. You were losing interest in schoolwork and... I, I tried my best to be normal and I have a very close friend, Timmy. And I had been neglecting him and he had been at my birthday party a couple weeks earlier and we just were having all kinds of fun. And I thought, I want to, I'm back in school now. I want to be with my friends. I want to be a normal kid. I've learned all I need to know about animals, and I'm staying away from Mr. Moyers. 
shop. Well, lo and behold, here comes the snake in our yard. So we had so much of a scare, my mother couldn't live anywhere in Springfield. We moved on the other side of town, 900 block of West State Street, went to Campbell School. And yet she was fearful that snake would be invading our neighborhood and attacking us. And so we had to move from Springfield. Saddest day of my life. I come back here every time I have an opportunity. Made a special trip down from Minnesota today. So you're living in Minnesota now? Yes, I am. Which surprises me because in your in your autobiography, when you were you spent your first five years in Minneapolis, that it was the winters did you and your father in. Yes, I had strep throat for five months and a shot every night of penicillin. Yeah. My father was had arthritis, he couldn't close or open his hands, he was just Yeah. But yeah. now you're living in Minnesota again. Well, it's my home state. Yeah. And I'm sure if I'd moved John out of Springfield, he'd be back soon enough. Oh, he'd be pining for it. He'd yes. be pining for the hills and hollers. He was the fortunate one. He got to stay and grow up here. Yeah. And I've watched the city grow, and I have so many memories of every place down on the square, all the movies I attended at the Fox Theater, adventures we had all over mm -hmm. Springfield. It was a marvelous life. Mm-hmm. But Minnesota turns out where most where my family lives. Yeah, whereabouts in Minnesota? I I, I spent uh, I spent I jokingly say, but it's kind of true. I spent three winters in Mankato, Minnesota. I live right near Mankato, twenty five miles. Really? Where? I lived closer than that in St. Peter for eight for uh, six years. Yeah. And then I lived eighteen years in uh, Springfield, which is farther west from Mankato. Uh -huh. And then now I live in the small community of Medelia, which uh -huh. is about 25 miles out. Yeah. Okay. I like small communities. Uh -huh. uh, now that I'm in my 70s, I'm 76. Uh -huh. I like a slower pace yeah. and more stability. Yeah. My years of adventure are great memories. Okay, one, one side thing I want to ask you about, and uh, maybe John knows this. 1953, was East St. Louis still Route 66? Or had the no, it was it was city rep. Oh, okay, city so, rep. But so now I, your vision of it today is not. It was much narrower. It's been single street's been wide, wide since, yeah, significantly. Yeah. But it ceased being the main. Yeah, it wasn't uh, the main that. thoroughfare. Right. Right. Carney Street and West Bypass. But there was still a lot of traffic. But a huge same. amount of traffic. A lot of traffic. Yeah. And I had to be very careful at six with not much experience yeah. you know, living in the big city. I had to be very careful going across that street, and apparently I did the right thing. I'm still here. Yeah. Um, and then you mentioned you lived in the in the clubhouse of Hickory Hills? Well, if we, when we moved For here, a couple of months, just a month or well, two. Well, yes, we moved here, and my father uh, was putting in this business, and he didn't want to be right in town. He wanted to be out away from the business, away from the squirrel, have a quiet country life, because he grew up in a quiet community. Yeah. And it was to me, it was perfect. It was ideal. So then I'm wondering, when did when did uh, John T. Woodruff's house burn down? The house out of Hickory. Yeah. That was in '59. So this would have been like pre that. Uh, yeah. yeah, this would have been the Woodruff place. Yeah. It, the yeah. house. So I you was, were living in the house that John T. Woodruff and his I wife. I don't remember. Well, he was dead by '53. Yeah. But, okay. He was the guy who, there was a golf course there. Yes. Nine it is holes? Now, it is now. Yeah. It wasn't then. It was a meadow in Nine? the woods. No, it was no, a golf course. No, it was a golf course. Because yeah. he, he built that golf he course. He built that golf course before he passed away. Yeah. I don't he remember died in 46, 46, 46, 47. Yeah. I always saw it as a meadow. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's another link to, John T. Woodruff was. Uh, Our uh, hero. Amazing. Uh, Extraordinary man. Uh, developer, I guess you'd call him. I don't know. Visionary. He was a visionary. He, he gets none for every bit of credit that people get for developing and building this city. He that, deserves twice that much and doesn't get it. That much of a personal investment. Mm -hmm. yeah. He built. He built more things by accident than people built by design. <laughs> yeah. 
you know, that's quite a recommendation for anybody. Mm. He loved golf, too. Yeah, he, he did. You could make an argument that he brought the game of golf to the Ozarks in the way of developing. And he was just, unique in a way that he, he figured out ways to uh, close up other golf courses, close up other competitors yeah. and build yeah. things. Yeah. He uh, <laughs> liked the Fed Man, which yeah. was Lakeshore Golf Course. Yeah. <laughs> He's quite, so anyway, just uh, meet someone that met that lived in Woodruff's house. Yes. Uh, oh, the iguana deal. One of Betty Love's pictures, one of the things killed in the Great Cobra Scare was a five-foot iguana, and we've got a picture of a police officer holding that dead iguana by the tail. Really? Yeah, it's a Betty <laughs> Love photo. It might have been the same iguana? It might have been. So it sounds like uh, Mr. Marr was, he was, I don't know how to phrase it, he was turning over animals. They'd come in the dead of night on Monday, and by Tuesday night they were gone to their next. Uh, mm -hmm. next and stop. and you tell this tale, and back to the snakes. He really loved that because he basically sold two snakes that day. Yes, he told me that. <laughs> I said, Mr. Moore, why would you sell the biggest snake in the world to these people? And he said. I already told my buyers I had a, the biggest snake, and he said, they asked me how big it was, and he said, I don't know. It's huge. I don't know exactly how big it is, but it's probably the largest ever captured. Yeah. But when he found out that the 33-foot snake was the largest, that manager arranged to buy that one from him and trade him the 21-foot snake, and he told me, I can sell this one too, that way I'll get paid twice in the deal. <laughs> so he did a little wheel in the deal. In he was on like a real wheel in the deal. I had handed him a newspaper article I saw that day, and he said, may I have your father's newspaper? And I said, he hasn't read it, I'll get in trouble. He said, pocket gave me a quarter, he said, buy him a new one and <laughs> mark it across the street, you keep the change. Well, I was all for that. That was four candy bars. Yeah. Yeah, four nickel candy bars. <laughs> um, Okay, we're about out of time, unfortunately, but I, you got to tell the story of the lion in the back of the Ford pickup truck. Oh, right. <laughs> and we have a picture of that. Do you want us to show the picture? No, well, well, maybe we'll try to we'll try to get the picture. Okay. And get it worked into it. But um, so before we, before you tell that story, though, I mean, you need to kind of um, the Cobra Scare was as as we like to say the tip of an iceberg where this guy was tip of the iceberg I wheeling and dealing and there was all kinds of animals crawling all over the neighborhood um and the other thing is that this had re this traumatized individuals and the entire community mm -hmm. what he was doing uh, it also got our house torn down yeah because they tear gassed the house to get the cobra out yeah and then after that, there was a call to the mayor's office constantly coming in. People said, do something with that stench. It was a frame house. Yeah. Nice house. It was very solid. Didn't have creaks in the floors or anything. But they couldn't get the stench out. It was out. ruined. Yeah. And my father was given two days to get everything out. And then the demolition crew came. Yeah. He wouldn't take me back to see where the house was. I was already traumatized pretty heavily. Yeah. And that put me in the hospital with migraines and all sorts of problems. Yeah. And those vanished, by the way, after we moved. You and moved to California, to right? Moved to California. Yeah. Uh, well, tell the story of the of the lion. The well, lion in the back of a Ford pickup truck. It was in a, a day in August, and I was looking out to see if it was a nice day to go out and play. It wasn't too hot. Of course, summers are always hot. Uh, I might go out. So I looked out the window, and as I was looking, a pickup truck pulled into his driveway. And the man got out and went to the store, and I looked, and I thought, something big and furry in there. I thought maybe it was a bear or something. So I said to my mom, would you like to go over and uh, see it with me? She says, no, absolutely not. I'm not going near that place. And I said, please, just this once. I think you'll enjoy it. It's not a snake. It's a furry animal, she said, oh, all right. So we walked over, and I was looking at it, and I got close enough I could see its face, and I said, it's a lion. She goes, oh, my gosh. Well, as I said that, there were two boys and their mother coming up the sidewalk, and they were making noise. And I went, shh. 
What? I said, shh. A lion in the truck. It could be dangerous. And he went, ooh. The mother and the kid came over and they were looking at it and sleeping away. And the other kid went over in the yard and he got a sharp stick and he goes around behind it. He jabbed it in the caboose. <laughs> Just like that, that lion was up and he went, right in our faces. It almost blew me across the street. I looked to see if mother was all right. She was already across the street with cars going everywhere. And she says, come home, come home, come home. <laughs> So I made my way home too. Man, my head was hurting. That was like being in front of a train when it gets a horn. I had no idea that it could be so loud. She was sick. She said, I'm going to bed. Well, she went to Your bed. poor mom. Yeah, she went to bed. She, it was a continuous stress on her. Yeah. So she went to bed and I thought, oh, I took baby aspirin and I thought, oh, I want to get a picture of the lion. So I got her camera out of the bureau in the, living, in the dining room, and I went across, almost tiptoeing, so at least the lion was asleep. He was awake, he was standing up in the truck bed looking at me, he didn't look happy. I hadn't done anything, but he still didn't welcome me. So I took my picture and got back home. I found that picture just a few weeks ago in some old envelopes my mother had photos in them. The, the negative was there, so I made enlargements on it. And it very clearly shows the lion, and it shows the license plate on the Ford truck that it was in. I need to find out who that owner was. Because oh, that, that was truck. an illegal <laughs> lion. And probably the license registration is long gone yeah. for 1950. The stories on this man could go from now until next Friday. Yeah. And we wouldn't cover first base. Yeah. There was an awful lot going on there. Well, we appreciate you sharing your uh, life experiences. I think we can definitely, these are life experiences. Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness, yeah. <laughs> well, this has been a great I mean, honor. we laugh about it now, but it was intense. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, it was tears and migraines and. Yeah, and it affected your life. For Instability. The, for the kids, it was an adventure. For the adults, it was traumatic. Yeah, your poor mom. Uh, but, you know, I had enough sense to realize the danger. He didn't. And I'm only six. Yeah, yeah. And I thought I should do something so about that was, it. So he was, must have been an ex, another Ozarks eccentric, I guess, yeah. you know. Uh, well, he's been described by others as playing with a short deck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he managed to sell two big snakes in one day, so. <laughs> you know, I have mixed feelings about him in all these 70 years since I went through yeah. all this. Yeah. It's, I can't believe it's that long. Yeah. I'm not old, I just have old <laughs> memories. Yeah. I can't I can't believe that in all this time the authorities didn't wonder just what was going on over there. Yeah. They could have seen for themselves. Yeah. And I didn't feel that I should be ratting them out. Yeah. It just didn't seem right. He was a friend to me. Yeah. But it is like, wow, how did how did he how well, how did he not become like a known entity in town? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and like Carl him. Barnett, who ultimately released the Cobras, he was 14. So that's that's the story I heard. Was he was a, uh, a disgruntled. He felt like he got cheated on a deal on some tropical fish. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so he was going to get back at well, he do some damage, do some vandalism. He would he would bring Mr. Moyer's snakes that he captured. And we'll trade them for fish. Work. Yeah, oh. trade them for fish. Oh, so he, was he a got fish, an exotic fish uh, tropical fish and took it home and it was dead. And he came back and said, the fish you sold me was dead. I want another one. Moyer said it was alive when it left. Buyer beware. And, and, money. and that story came out 40 years later 40. to Michael Bryan. Oh, yeah. The same guy <laughs> that reported that, that, aired, that hunted down, that was, you know, hunted down Mauer. So it took 40 years for the truth to come out. Right. What well, happened. that part of the truth. Yeah. yeah. Now, But I, you were there. Your mom was everybody like, knew, ah! Everybody knew they had to come from ours. Yeah. And that's why they pulled his business license. Oh. And yeah. then he left town. Oh, I see. But so. he always denied he had none escape. Yeah. Yeah. He denied it. He mm -hmm. denied it. Now, consider Carl Barnett was not a teenager anymore when he finally fessed up. Yeah. Uh -huh. and in my whole life, I wondered if I could have stopped that by 
down in the horn. Mm -hmm. It's too late now. And yeah, he was in his fifties when he finally owned up. To so it. he carried that knowledge for four yeah. decades. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. And it wasn't until this last fall when I met John I came down. It was October, I believe. Mm -hmm. And we went to the history museum and met him there, and we discovered that he had the same we teacher, had a shared experience, so the same classroom. So mm -hmm. October is either your favorite month, or <laughs> you, <laughs> well, go, it's not you go Wall Street's favorite. Yeah. You go, you go to bed for the entire month. I mean, my, my my his mother got headaches. My mother just got blithering crazy. Yeah. She would stand at the back door with the door shut, make my father go out to the car. Because we just parked in the backyard of this house. It was a apartment house cut a house cut up into four apartments. And the whole backyard is where everybody yeah. parked. Yeah. And she would make him go out to the car, open the car door, and then once the car door was open and the coast was clear, we had to run one at a time, and I mean run, as fast as we could go to the car yeah. and get in Dive with in. him guarding the door of the car till she was the last one out of the house. And scampered across and got in, and he closed the door, and we drove away. And this was, and we did that till the first freeze. The whole town was on edge. terrified. Yeah, and the authorities didn't come. Yeah. They didn't investigate what's, it, what's going on in this neighborhood. Yeah. They didn't. See Other it. businesses did crazy. I mean, like I've got I've got ads from beauty shops that had cobra hairdos for women. <laughs> I've got I've got ad, I've got ads from shoe shops that had special. Snake proof shoes. I mean, everybody was jumping on the bandwagon to try to make a little off this thing. And the Cobra beer. Yeah, Cobra, cobra beer. beer. Yeah. Now they then they it. put the Cobra on the city seal. <laughs> the city, the shield, the city seal of the city of Springfield. They put a Cobra wrapped around it with its head up on the top of the shield. Uh, and I, you were there at the start of the whole thing. I was six year old. The thing. I was a six fly year old on the wall. Boy, you know? then, yeah. then it was like, it was like uh, uh, Mel Brooks. There, they would get 30 or 40 guys with hoes and rakes and pitchforks and God knows what, <laughs> following a ra that radio truck. That, I, we heard that radio truck <laughs> night and day. The big Reed radio truck with that big speaker horn on top of it, playing snake charmer music, <laughs> driving around slowly downtown, and all this long lynch mob of people following it. All, all they needed was flaming torches, <laughs> just waiting for the snakes to come out being attracted by the music. And just, Which they couldn't hear. No, they couldn't hear. Snakes the can't snakes hear. Can't the hear music's music. for the snake charmer, not for the snake. <laughs> for the so the snake charmer would move rhythmically with music and would rhythm the snake into you know, being calm. Yeah. Gentlemen, I have to say this. Every time I come to Springfield, I'm a kid again. No. <laughs> I'm, I'm immersed in this. I love Missouri. Oh, it has yeah. always been my home. Missouri is a great state. And as I wrote my story, the Ozarks was a great region. Springfield was once home to me. Today it still is. Yeah. And all the photographs, everything Betty Love took, is in the space from his house to my house. Uh -huh. Right there on St. Louis Street between the 900 block and the 1400 block. Been there behind the old plumbing shop that's next to the, to the uh, uh, veterinary Shop there across from Price Cutter, uh -huh. all of that area in there, all, that, all the photographs all were taken space. right in that space. Uh, well, what a story! Um, thank you very much for coming down. You're and, welcome. Uh, it's a great pleasure.